Hi, my name is Sarish Sudekran and in this video, we'll analyze the cinematography of Nestor Almendros. The goal of this brief video is to break down his techniques so you have a starting place to learn more about his work. Nestor Almendros passed away at a young age, but not before leaving a legacy most cinematographers can only dream of. The two directors most associated with him are Eric Romer and Francois Truffaut. Together, they showed the world how low-budget independent cinematography can sometimes be more exceptional than when you have too many options, which was his core philosophy, to eliminate every unnecessary light or tool so the acting and story takes prominence above all. His strategy was to always augment what was already on location, never to overpower it. He always stuck to one motivated light source, usually the sun. When he was indoors or in the studio, he imagined how the sun would light the room and that guided his choices. He first tried to use the light available, but it always needed some reinforcement due to the traveling sun. He was a consistent user of mirrors to bounce sunlight into a room. He also used practicals as motivated light and just bounced off them to wrap faces. On exteriors, he used reflectors or cards or sometimes just bounce light off materials like Riflon or other fabrics. His goal was to achieve an even layer of soft light without any hard shadows, and this allowed his directors to explore the scene as they saw fit. When lighting wasn't an option, he mostly stuck to backlighting, shooting at golden hour or when it was slightly overcast. He typically backlit his actors so the exposure on their faces remained constant longer. The epitome of this technique, for which he won an Academy Award, can be found in Days of Heaven. A few portions of it were shot by Haskell Wexler, who had to step in because Nestor had a prior commitment. He always tried to eliminate diffusion and unmotivated close-ups. He also disliked slow motion and other gimmicks. He focused all his attention on creating an atmosphere by the elimination of unnecessary light, and to highlight his actors so they could take center stage, almost like a vignette. He was one of the first to use the orange tone look in The Collector, which was his first film with Eric Romer. Legend has it they only had five photo floods and made do with practicals or whatever they could lay their hands on. Today, cinematographers can take note. He wasn't afraid to put his actors against burned out skies. He avoided the blue postcard sky for its own sake and never let the landscape overpower the actors. However, when it was called for, like in Story of Adele, he underexposed to preserve the texture of subdued natural light. For night scenes, he tried to augment existing street lamps or use them strategically to light his actors. He also experimented with color balance. For example, in The Last Metro, he dipped a 25-watt bulb in yellow bath for interiors and replaced street lamps with blue bulbs to create the unique world of that movie. In Mistress, when faced with bare walls and no window, he used fluorescent tubes on walls and fixtures to create an alternate underground reality. He usually opened up the aperture as wide as possible. He shot at a time when film stock wasn't very sensitive. He used the entire range of focal lens, even telephoto lenses, when it was called for. With camera movement, he continued his logic of keeping things simple and always preferred the simple tripod or smooth dolly move to other techniques. Superficial camera movements weren't his thing. When he lit faces, he had a variable contrast ratio, sometimes flat, sometimes very high, but mostly at around two stops. He typically lit in the paramount or three-quarter pattern from above. His catch lights were almost always point sources of light. There is a widespread misconception he was a soft light guy, but a simple look at his work will show quite clearly he always had hard or semi-soft light, sometimes with multiple shadows, a throwback to the classical era. In his latter work, he mostly stuck to Panavision cameras and lenses. He almost always shot spherical and rarely anamorphic. He preferred the Academy 1.66 and 1.85 to 1 aspect ratios, and his stock of choice was almost always Eastman from Kodak. He even shot quite a few films in black and white. He was inspired by paintings and the influence of this is quite apparent in even a brief perusal of his work. We can also lay to rest the fallacy he only used natural light. I don't think it is disputed that Nestor Almendros is a huge inspiration to many modern cinematographers. Yet, I had a hard time finding information for this video. You can't find many interviews or techniques of his work, which is a shame. 
Luckily, he did write a book, A Man with a Camera, which is mandatory reading for any budding cinematographer. I link to it in the description. The sad part is the book is out of print, so expect to pay a premium unless you're lucky enough to catch it in a library. I hope this brief video has stoked your interest in his stunning work. He was a giant who was wrested away from us too soon. A PDF summary of this video is available on Patreon. If there is a favorite cinematographer whose work you want analyzed, let me know. To see more videos like this one, please subscribe. There are lots more on the way. Bye now.